Well, the sermon is titled this morning, Overcoming Evil with Good. Overcoming Evil with Good, just three verses today. And yet these three verses will present challenges for us. These are, <laughs> these are challenging verses. And uh, you talk about countercultural. This is not in us naturally. This is, a, this is a response that moves way beyond what would be natural or expected. So let's, uh, let's jump in here and begin. I just want to, by way of review, um, look at where we left off. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And then this verse, if possible, so far as it depends on you, believer, live peaceably with all. Okay, so that's the flow. That's the, the, the movement of these verses. Now, verse 19 moves us into what I'm calling recognition and restraint. Recognition and restraint. Lots of fill in the blanks this morning. It'll be helpful if you take notes. And uh, if you miss anything, talk to my wife. She'll get you, she'll get you the, the, the missing uh, fill in the blanks. I know some of those type A people just hate it when they miss the blank. I get it. I'm with you. So recognition and restraint. Verse 19. Beloved, never, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That's quite a command for us to obey. (laughs) That is an incredible thing to consider. I was thinking about this and thinking about how many movies have topped the charts in what I would call revenge genre. TV shows, entire TV shows that have, you know, six, seven, eight seasons are built upon revenge, vengeance, getting things sorted out, make it right, do what you have to do. Vigilante justice. This is when uh, I don't have authority to do what I do, but you know what? I've been wrong, and I'm going to take matters into my own hands, and I'm just going to go make it right. There was a Facebook post that went around last year about a father whose daughter was horrifically violated by a man, and he decided, you know, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And he went, and I believe he hunted this guy down beat him and killed him and there was a movement to not only um, appease this but to celebrate what he had done and then raise legal fees to defend him and many people were jumping onto this now let's be clear it is deep in us this sense of justice where does that come from It comes from God, who is perfectly just. We are made in His image. Why do we care about justice? Why does it matter when someone is violated and we say, no, that's wrong? That points to the God who is, who cares even more than we do or ever could about sin and violations and offenses. However, for us to celebrate a murderer as if somehow that is justice. We have to go back and understand justice is what the Lord establishes it. And those He bestows authority on carry that authority. We're going to see as, as we cover into, into verse uh, chapter 13 next week. That authority tracks back to God. Right? So, so there is a path and a, and a way, a legal system that is set up to pursue justice. We are not to take matters in our own hands and become criminals and, and somehow say that we are righting wrongs. That's murder. It should not be celebrated. It should not be defended. It should be called by Christians what it is. And at the same time, we are to be sympathetic to those who have experienced horrific injustice. It's important that we think carefully on this, not just jump on bandwagons of the culture. Revenge. 
Here's what's interesting. If you move it out of that context, you know, the, the big sins and murders, and, and you move it into just the context of marriage, right? Husbands and wives. <laughs> I just imagine the marriage counseling that I've done over the years. If, if first these verses were applied, think of how many marriage disputes would evaporate. Well, but I can't let that go. He did this. That's why I do this. Well, wait a second. Why? What's behind this? Well, at the end of the day, that's, that's revenge. Hmm. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it. Listen to these words. Leave it. Leave revenge. Leave the offense. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. There is an incredible connection between forgiveness and wrath. You see this? One of the reasons we will struggle to forgive is because we do not appreciate rightly, as we should biblically, the category of the wrath of God. If you have a small view of the wrath of God, you will have a hard time leaving it to God to avenge the wrongs in your life. What will you say? Well, I, I can't let that go. If I let that go, who's going to make them pay? It's my job, isn't it? You see, if you don't have a category for the wrath of God, you become the wrath giver. You carry the load you were never intended to carry. That's where bitterness comes from. Resentment. That is where murder begins in the heart hatred animosity i will get them back they're terrible person they did this listen we're not eliminating the sin we're not downplaying this forgiveness is never to say well that sin is no big deal but pastor if i don't repay them it means they're getting away with it it means they're getting away with it Hmm. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and keeps wrath for His enemies. The mountains quake before Him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before Him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before His indignation? Who can endure the heat of His anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and rocks are broken into pieces by Him. Nahum chapter 1. I like how John Piper said it. Forgiveness never means that even one sin goes unpunished. Ever. Every sin that has ever been committed will receive its due recompense. Either in hell for those who have spurned their substitute, right? Or in the substitute himself, Jesus Christ, on the cross. There are two places that sin is paid for in its fullness. The fires of hell or the cross of Christ. Are you going to take that out of God's hands? Do you think that what you can do in vengeance is going to supersede the fires of hell? You see, you see, when we begin to understand, leave it to God. That means if He deems it that the person who has done such offensive things to you will drink of the wrath of God for an eternity in the fires of hell. Your wrath doesn't hold a candle to that. Leave it to God. Leave it to His wrath. Or if he decides to show grace and mercy to bring that person to repentance and faith, then the wrath that they deserve is poured upon Jesus Christ, who is their substitute, who is in their place. Are you going to pour wrath upon the the Son that, that the Father has decided is sufficient? Are you going to add to this wrath, subtract from it? No. Leave it to God. Leave it to His wrath. 
One of the reasons we have a disconnect between wrath and forgiveness is we don't appreciate the cross. The cross of Christ is one of the greatest displays of the wrath of God the world has ever known. It is the great display of God's wrath. And the whole point is sin is a big deal and I will never let even one sin go unpunished. Forgiveness isn't, oh, forget about it. It's no big deal. I'll just forget it ever happened. No, forgiveness is, I paid for that by pouring wrath upon my son that you might be forgiven. Or you are storing up for yourselves an eternal torture under the wrath of God. Forgiveness and wrath. So the call here today is lay it down. Lay it down. Pastor, you you don't realize this person so deeply hurt me. They, They offended me to the nth degree and they never said they were sorry. They have never apologize they've never turned from it all the more reason to lay it down lay it down release it let God take it up let him take it up you don't have to avenge it's not on you to do this you were never intended to carry that role it's too much for us but you don't understand This person is a terrible person. They're they're defaming my reputation and and they're blaming me for the divorce, right? Fill in the blank. All of the things that come with this. Lay it down. Lay it down. Leave it to God. And in addition to that, there's more. <laughs> just, just in case we felt like that was enough, the Scriptures push beyond. It's not even enough just to lay it down. There's, there's more that can happen. As soon as we release this, as soon as we lay it down, it opens the door for love. Love of enemies. Kindness and repentance. Verse 20. To the contrary... If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. This, this is a, a tangible expression of kindness. This is, this is moving way past what would ever be expected. This is into that unexpected love we spoke about a few weeks ago, right? It's, what are you doing? I have been treating you horribly. Yes, you have. Yep, <laughs> can't disagree with you there. Would you like a glass of water? Are you hungry? Uh, In 2010, there was a large group of people that rose up and caused all kinds of problems here. They tried to fire me and they falsely accused me of all kinds of things. And uh, a lot of you don't know this, but in the middle of all of that, some of those people, we, we were like, how can we express these verses in the midst of this? And there were some situations going on with one couple in particular that they, they were hurting and, and we decided, you know what? We're going to love them, even still. And so we made a big dinner and we bought flowers and we delivered it to their house. And I never, I'll never forget knocking on that door. <laughs> These people were hostile. They were hurting us deeply, harming this church, leading people away falsely. And I held out that lasagna and gave the flowers to cold faces. Cold. That was the last time I saw them. That was not easy to do. There was another family in the church that was getting ready to move and they needed help cleaning their house up and they were at the middle of all of this as well and I went over there and, and, and began to help them clean their house and do various projects that they needed help with. And as I'm doing this, I hear them making fun of me in the house with a group of ladies. This is not easy to do. <laughs> it's not easy to do with a 
heart of love, okay? This is tenacious, unworldly, supernatural. I will love you. It's kindness in the face of hostility, enmity, hatred. It's not natural love. It's Christ-like love. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? We were His enemies. And He took the cross. So, you have different glimpses of this. One of the greatest glimpses of this is when Jesus washes the feet of Judas. The night He would be betrayed. I mean, hours from the betrayal. Jesus is on His knees, dressed as a servant, doing the job that none of the other disciples had the humility to do. Jesus led the way, and He washed the feet of the betrayer. That moment, that was not show. That was real. That was real love And Jesus leads us in this. He modeled this for us. He knew what was coming. He knew everything that was about to take place. Jesus betrayed, uh, Judas betrayed Jesus with clean feet. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. (laughs) For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And all of a sudden we're like, what? What? Is that, is, that, is that why I'm doing this? So I'm like, here's a glass of water. Enjoy the burning coals. <laughs> you know, is that, is that what's going on? It's like a give and take. Hey, how about that lasagna? That's not what this is. That's not what this is. To be clear, we do not... Do heartfelt, loving, kind gestures so that people will burn. That's not the motive. That misses the whole point. We, we've got to understand what these burning coals are. What is, it, what is in view here? Well, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. So I guarantee you it's not, hey, I'm giving you water, but I'm really hoping to heap up God's judgment on your head. We know that's not it. What are these burning coals? I believe these burning coals are the longing that repentance will come. That when all of a sudden they are blown away by an act of love and kindness, they are so shocked and struck at the contrast of our love and their hostility that they are ashamed of their behavior and repent of their sin and may even be saved by the power of Christ that saved us. This is the longing. It is I love you in tangible ways so that if there may be an opportunity for you to turn from your sin, my love will point the way. I have been loved when I was an enemy and I choose to love you even though you are behaving as an enemy to me. This is powerful. It's powerful stuff. It's expressions of love and peace that long for repentance. We're longing for repentance when we do these things. Now, here's the reality. It may never come. It may be laughed off. You may be ridiculed, as I experienced in in a couple of those interactions. You might not see it, but love anyway. Keep loving. Show grace. Show mercy. Show kindness. My friend John, I talked to John just a couple days ago. I wanted to make sure I told the story accurately. He's from California. An amazing example of how God works. John is uh, a very gifted man. He was uh, very involved in Silicon Valley startup world, uh, venture capital, all of that stuff, back in the day when it was just launching. And he was married to this amazing lady who had, they, they had two boys together. 
the problem is, is that John was far more married to his job. He was the definition of workaholic. He poured himself into his job, and he basically tread upon his wife and his two boys. Came to the point where he had had multiple adulteries and uh, affairs, and he d- decided one day, you know what, I'm done. I'm just done. I'm done with you. I'm done with the boys. The next day, he left and never looked back. Tens of thousands of dollars in child support went unpaid. They would arrange opportunities for him to meet up with his boys, and he would blow them off. He would leave them waiting at a playground. Year after year of this, 13 years passed. What happened is John gave his soul to Silicon Valley. He made a ton of money, and then he lost it all. He ended up living out of a rented car on the streets down there. He would go to the Kiwanis or whatever it was and and, and shower from time to time. He was homeless, destitute. And he received word that his ex-wife wanted to meet him at Chili's one day. This is 13 years later. So he goes to Chili's, barely can get enough courage to go in. He's so ashamed of himself, of his life, of of his position. He walks into Chili's and there's his ex-wife who had, by the way, remarried and and, uh, this man had led her to the Lord before they were married. He was a believer. She was saved. They got married. Subsequently, both his boys had been saved by Christ. Okay, so (laughs) you've got three believers walking into Chili's and John unsaved. They greet him warmly with hugs, and they come to this booth. It's a four-person booth, and he's trying to be chivalrous and says, no, you go in, and she says, no, why don't you go in first? So he slides in, and then she slides in next to him and, and slides right up, right up next to him warmly, and his two boys slide in across the table, and she says, John, We wanted to meet you here today because we want to tell you about something amazing that's happened to us. We've been saved from our sins by Jesus Christ. He's changed our lives. And she looks him in the eye, sitting right next to him, and says, I want you to know that I forgive you. I forgive you. And then Tristan One of his boys chimes in from across the table. Yeah, Dad, we love you. We forgive you. We want you in our lives. His other son, yeah, we do. I forgive you as well. John said that day was the most significant day of his life to that point. He was shell-shocked. He didn't even know how to process this kind of gospel-empowered love and kindness, and forgiveness, and warmth. They had every reason to hate their dad. She had every reason to garnish everything he had for the rest of his life. She forgave tens of thousands of dollars in back unpaid child support and said, I love you, and I forgive you. You know what happened? God used that moment, that display of forgiveness to lead this man to Christ. And it was shortly thereafter that he was saved from his sins by God. He goes and he shares this story every time he has opportunity. He's got notes. In fact, I'm on the phone with him and he pulls out his notes and he's crying, remembering these. To this day, he still weeps about the love he experienced in that moment. Friends, That is supernatural love. That's the kind of love that will grab the attention of a dark world and say, what is this? And how do I taste of it? Now, verse 21, remember and resolve. Remember and resolve. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, very simple command. Do not and resolve. Do. This is a a negative and a positive. Do not be overcome. This echoes of do not be conformed, right? 
do not be overcome by evil, but instead overcome evil with good. Our longing is to overcome the evil. How do we do it? With good. With good. So am I being pulled down or am I pulling up? Friends, you can turn the news on. You can find every reason to be grumpy. A grumpy Christian. A grumbling Whatcom County resident. Disgruntled. Joyless. Angry. Even hostile. That is not our mission. That is a breach of this command. We are called away from that response. Even though the world come undone in darkness and evil, we are called to not be overcome by that. How do we do that? Ephesians 6, right? Get the armor on. Stand firm, therefore, in the strength of the Lord. And begin to reach out hands and pull people up out of the gutter. Bring them in out of the dark. Point the way to the light of Christ. How does this happen? How does it happen? Let's go through these in rapid fire. I tried to think tangibly. These are incredibly practical verses. But, but how? How do you do it? That's the question. Here are a few thoughts, things that we need to rehearse, and, and probably regularly so. E- these are easy things to forget. So, Seven gospel things. Number one, gospel power. It all begins with gospel power. You can't do this unless you are a believer. It is impossible to do. You must be saved. You must be drawing from the strength of an infinitely powerful God who has loved. We love? Why? How? Because He first loved us. You got to tap into that love before you can ever show this kind of love to the world. So, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is who bears much fruit. If you want to bear fruit in this way, you must be saved. You must be clinging to Jesus. And then he says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't do this apart from Christ. You have to have Jesus as the bedrock foundation. So gospel power. Secondly, gospel identity. Gospel identity. This is huge in a day that can find identity and sexual preferences and the weirdest of things, right? We, they put it, that's all, this is who I am. Really? That is who you are? You're going to define your existence by that, Christian? Our identity is simple. It's straightforward. It's so easy. And it should be so evident in our lives. This is who I am. I am a Christian. My life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. I dwell secure. I fear no man. Who are you, believer? You are His. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. You are not defined by your past sins. You are defined by every obedience of Jesus Christ. Behold, new has come. You are not who you were. You are who you are in Christ and who you are becoming in Him day by day. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Every day I wake up is a day of faith. I live in you today, Lord. I walk in you. I draw strength from you today. Help me to live in you for your glory today. We can come up with all kinds of things to live in idolatrous things. I live in this. I live in this. I'm defined by this. Some people, it's, it's so weird. Their entire identity becomes wrapped up in the Seahawks. Right? That's laughable now, but when we were in the Super Bowl, trust me, <laughs> it was a lot easier then. Right? Or, or the vehicle you drive. You can get wrapped up in the vehicle. You drive up. Man, this is who I am. 
<laughs> or the job on your business card. This is what I do. It's who I am. It is not. You are a Christian. It's who you are. It's who He's made you. Third, gospel purpose. Because of who you are, you have a reason. You have a purpose. There is a a goal for your life. I exist for the glory of God. I am to live for His glory. I am to build His kingdom, to esteem His reputation, point people to Him, make disciples. In short, shine. That's why I'm here. That's my purpose statement of my life. that's, That's what we do. It's what we do collectively. So gospel power, gospel identity, gospel purpose. We are His workmanship, Paul says to the Ephesian church. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Some of those good works are to be done to our enemies. Some of those good works are the acts of kindness and giving, food or water, help or aid or assistance, a word of encouragement, a note, kindness, whatever expression you can come up with, those, by the way, were prepared by God beforehand that we should walk in them. He prepared those good works for us to live in before let there be light. That's pretty wild. They're they're predestined works for us to live in. Number four, gospel reality. Oh, this is important. I I preached a sermon years ago on the gospel glasses. I had a set of glasses without lenses back then when I actually didn't need glasses. I was younger then. (laughs) We need to wear the gospel like glasses. It's the lens through which we see the world. We interpret things through the ultimate reality of the gospel. My enemy has a soul. You've got to remind yourself of this. This is not just a dude. This is not just a problem. This is a person made in the image of God who has a soul. I see eternal implications here. This person might go to hell. Ultimately, this is not about me. You've got to remember that. Many times in the Christian life, When we suffer, we suffer for the name, for the sake of the name. Even that suffering can be ordained by God for His glory. Sometimes, it's helpful to remember, you know what, this this really isn't about me. Ultimately, this person will give account before God. Their greatest need is the gospel. I have this person in my life for a reason. My brother and I used to work on a golf course when we were uh, in college in the summers. And we worked with a guy who was the most vulgar man I'd ever known. He worked on an Alaskan fishing boat uh, at at times. He was was pure Alaskan fishing fishing boat material. Just rough and tumble, wanted to fight at the drop of a hat. um, Tattooed, smoking, everything you could imagine. And cussing like a sailor constant and he, he just he just locked on to my brother and I he loved to make fun of us and by God's grace we put on the lenses of the gospel and we both felt for this man this man was lost in depravity in the dark stumbling around and all of a sudden his jokes and insults they didn't really hurt that much we understood that one of the reasons he was coming after us is because we were shining We were pointing the way to Christ. And this actually was more about his relationship with God or lack thereof. By God's grace, we worked on him, offered to pray with him, and it wasn't too long before he he walked into church with us in Yakima. I'll never forget that day. (laughs) He had a few cuss words because he didn't know how not to cuss. It was a really, really good sermon. Let me just put it that way. I pray that we will see him in glory. You see how we can do this? We've got to, we've got to choose. Number five, gospel anticipation. Remembering God's promises. What, what is coming? What, what do we know? How can we anticipate what the gospel tells us? Number one, I am his. 
Christ holds me. My future is secure. I don't have to be threatened by this. Even if my life is on the line, to live is Christ, to die is gain. My reward is coming. My God is my portion forever. God knows, He sees, and He will uphold justice. Leave it to the wrath of God. That's what, that's what this call is. Don't become the avenger. Don't take on that role. Trust Him. Look to Him. Remember what is true, what is certain, what is unshakable in this life and the next. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? What a great verse to remember. When you are the, on the receiving end of offense, great offense, the kind of offense that says, no, that's not right. Run here. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Now, we're going to be talking next week about legal recourse, about boundaries, all of these. This brings up all kinds of questions, doesn't it? God has appointed structures of authority to, to bring to bear. Like we have law enforcement. We love that. That's a good thing. The authority they carry is bestowed on them from God. There's a purpose to that authority. We're going to look at that next week. So it doesn't mean that there's no response that would hold to account. It means that the response is to be within the realm of authority that God has put in place and to trust Him with it. Number six, gospel sacrifice. Gospel sacrifice. Everybody have that blank filled in? <laughs> Good job. You're doing great. I will entrust my situation to the Lord. He will bring perfect justice. I will not hold a grudge. I will not be bitter. I will release. I will forgive. There's a big debate about whether you're supposed to forgive if they haven't asked for forgiveness and all of those things. And I would just say this. Christ died while I was still a sinner. You know, he didn't say, you come and, and, and initiate this. He started the process. He initiated the, the work. He, he purchased my pardon. So, it is significant, it is important that we love in such a way. We don't wait for them to come first. We set our heart, release the offense, and have that attitude of love and kindness and charity. And long for that day, if God would be so gracious that that kind demeanor, that, that just loving spirit of response would may possibly lead to their repentance where they would come and say, I am so sorry for what I said to you, for the way I treated you. I was a total jerk. You have every right to hate me. Would you forgive me? I was wrong. Maybe that moment will come. But don't hold it. Don't take up the job of being the, the, the judge, jury, and executioner. It's not your job. I will release. I will forgive. I will be free. I am free in Christ. I can do this. This is the sacrifice. This is part of what love will cost you. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. <laughs> what a proverb. Oh, for those who are just ready to throw down at a moment's notice, this is for you. Restraint. Sourced in the gospel. Unnatural. Yes, but right and true strength is in view here points out meekness. Meekness is not weakness. It is power under control. And the meek will inherit the earth, friends. But now you must put them all away, Paul says to us. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its old practices. That's who you were. It's not who you are in Christ. The sacrifice. For the sake of Christ then, Paul says, I am content with weakness. I am content with insults, 
hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Then Peter came up to Jesus and said to him, How often will my brother, uh, will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? <laughs> Remember this one? Oh, if we could have seen Peter's face when Jesus replied. Jesus said to him, I do not say seven times, but 70 times seven. And in case you're tempted to do the math, the point is, don't stop forgiving. Don't stop forgiving. We are to be a people defined by tender-hearted forgiveness, not calloused, cold, indifference. I will punish you for what you've done to me. It's not who we are. And number seven, gospel responses. Gospel responses. It's not enough just to restrain. It's, it's more than that. We're called to go on the offense, to play, to play it out, to, to choose to behave in a way, to, to initiate engagement. How can I pray for this person? That's really where it begins, isn't it? <laughs> in the heart, Lord, help me. Want to love such that when I move in this way, it's not just mechanical, but heartfelt. What kindness can I show to them? What does it look like to move to someone in kindness? Now remember the verse just before this, if possible, so far as it depends on you. Sometimes you can't break through. Sometimes they won't even receive your kindness. Sometimes it just doesn't work. But don't be the one that hangs up the process. How can I love them the way Christ loved me? Our response this morning, this is a very practical sermon. My prayer is that the Lord is bringing people to mind, situations, even family members, maybe a spouse, a former spouse, maybe a a client or an employer. Who knows? God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the kind of love we've tasted of. It's the kind of love that defines our lives. So let all bitterness, Christian, and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. That's not who we are. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Who do you need to release this morning? Who comes to mind? The reality is is that every single person in this room has been on the receiving end of offense. All of us have. We've also been on the giving end, haven't we? We're sinners. It is dangerously possible to walk through life and be dragging baggage of bitterness. Everywhere you go, even to church, you come in and you're just dragging that bag and you just, I can't let this go because if I do, who's going to make him pay? Answer, let God take care of that. Take that bag and drag it to the foot of the cross and just lay it down. Just leave it there. Don't drag that around anymore. Who is it? What grudge do you need to lay down? Who needs to be entrusted to God? Leave it to God. Leave them to God. Even more so than that, then begs the question, who should you bless this week? Who can you move to with kindness, with flowers or lasagna? (laughs) What kindness can you show? This is hard, hard work. It is not natural, is it? But it is God-honoring, God-glorifying. It'll turn the world upside down of the darkness. And maybe, maybe some will be saved. That's our greatest longing. That's our mission. That's why we're here. Maybe God will break through and those coals, that, that repentance, that ashes on their head would, would would be a gift of God that would bring them to repentance and salvation in Christ. Let's pray.
Oh, Father, we thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that you didn't wait for us to be good enough to come to you, but even in our railing against you and our sins and, and as enemies, you came and sent your Son to take upon himself all of our sins. We delight in that provision. and with that, that kind of love defines us, Lord. Help it to be the way we walk in this world. Help that kind of love to be just emanating from us in our interactions. Oh, help us with this, Lord. This is not easy. This is, this is a tenacious kind of love that we don't have strength for on our own, and so we draw deeply from the Gospel to draw this up in and let it flow out in fruit for Your glory. Bring freedom, O oh God, today here. I pray that many would find release, that they would lay it down and let You take it up. We trust You. We delight in You. Oh God, God of love and God of wrath, thank You for all that You are. In Jesus' name, amen.